day we're celebrating a couple of days early um, uh, a holiday that's celebrated in um, primarily the Himalayan regions where Vajrayana uh, dharmas practiced it's called the uh, Labab Duchen so uh, descent uh, great practice descent from heaven <clears throat> At one point, and this may have been a historic uh, situation, um, the Buddha uh, uh, decided to uh, visit his uh, birth mother, who was in uh, one of the heaven realms. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, that's open to a lot of different interpretations. I, I, I don't think he was necessarily trying to rescue her, but you know, uh, the you know, give teachings. Um, the interesting part of that story for me, though, is uh, he was gone a long time, and uh, students got kind of like um, annoyed or worried, like that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, this this happened, of course. Um, you know, periodically during the Buddha's lifetime is um, he uh, went on retreat a number of different times, just said, I'm, I'm going to go on retreat. Um, according to the uh, information we have passed down, sometimes he decided, okay, I need to get some retreat time. Sometimes um, actually he was kind of fed up because people were arguing. It's in the suttas, you can read it, you know. They totally get that, you know. Um, and this was a similar time where, you know, no doubt he um, was on deep retreat and he may have said why he was going and, um, you know, maybe things were falling apart, I don't know. Um, it's similar to the fear of llamas moving. Um, I'm not leaving, we're expanding the mandala, is um, how I like to look at it. But um, it's the same thing, so... Um, for me, you know, uh, I, I like uh, explaining the inner meanings of this, where in Asia, of course, um, it's going to be the holidays and the situation is going to be held uh, through ritual and mythology, right? We're not going to bring it back into personal practice necessarily. We're going to talk about the heavens and the visits and um, the teachings as being objective events that happen in three-dimensional world and time, just like here. But um, I, that's not part of my culture, although I can go there. But I, I think for us to feel it, um, we have to um, know some of the inner teachings behind it, too. And then when we do the rituals, or if we did some long prayers and visualize the heaven of the 33 and his mom and him descending from this special staircase, then um, it, it wouldn't have just a fantasy quality to it. It would have like also um, Dharma meaning. But I like the story or the myth or the event because um, it shows that the Buddha was operating as a chaplain. So chaplaincy for me means that we have training as professional bodhisattvas and we go and meet people where they are. Um, training generally means like we have to bring people together in a training place like here so that we can hear teachings and get professional views and attitudes and then we go out and, and benefit others. <clears throat> So that doesn't always mean being a roving Dharma teacher, but actually just going to people's houses. So chaplaincy is a little bit different than giving teachings around the world. It's um, giving uh, benefit and help and teachings to people that may or may not be, you know, or don't have to be and probably aren't uh, Buddhist or have be on any particular spiritual path. We're just doing raw compassion right? <laughs> like that <clears throat> so I, the, the buddha um uh may have had a sense that he needed to um you know uh maybe get his mommy issues straight you know could be psychoanalytic like that 
Um, I'm sure Jesus had his mommy issues, right? So we all have our mommy issues. Or um, he saw in a vision that um, she wanted to see how he was doing too. That's part of chaplaincy. People say, you know, I want to see how you're doing. I'm fine, but I just want to see how you're doing. So, you know, um, uh, like that. So basically, uh, I see the the holiday as, as a chaplaincy holiday where we're maybe willing to um, leave the comfort of our own situation and, uh, you know, take a journey. Uh, as chaplains or as a chaplain myself, then uh, I'm also willing to put some people uncomfortable to go make a chaplaincy visit because that's what the Buddha did. He said, I'm going to make you guys a little uncomfortable, maybe not on purpose, but he knew he would if he um, is gone for a while. And um, you're going to have to deal with things and um, see the omnipresence of the Lama, of the Guru, um, and not just the body form, and uh, support me doing some chaplaincy work, you know, rather than I always want you around so we can ask you questions, you know. <laughs> no, it's like, um, I, he, he probably knew that, you know, some people would be worried if he went in long retreat, and um, particularly if he didn't say, um, which in the West, in the East, teachers will kind of, I'm just going on retreat. They could just say that, and they're not, they don't have to say when they'll be back. And traditionally, you just kind of, well, okay, well, well, we'll know they're back when they're back. <laughs> of course, we want to know, like, okay, what, what day are you going to be back? Because <laughs> There'll be a lot of shit going on, and when you come back, we want you to fix it. Okay, you know that kind of style. It's like obviously it happens in Asia too. But <clears throat> so probably the Buddha just said, you know, I'm going to go on retreat for a while, and got some people I want to visit, and um, yeah, like that. So um, that's chaplaincy work because when we go out and visit people in their homes or work or in jail or in the hospital. Um, we don't know exactly what situation, right? Here we kind of have a controlled situation, right? That's what, you know, you know timing and ritual and decorum do, you know, it's, we're kind of in control. But um, and there's somewhat in control in a hospital setting, but as those of us who've worked in hospitals are currently, um, control can be illusory. <laughs> so it, unexpected. <clears throat> but, uh, Generally, when we go out and do chaplaincy, we're, we're willing to let go to a certain level of control in order to meet people where they are and ask them what they need and want. <clears throat> and um, that can involve um, traveling a long distance, and then the person um, says, I, I don't want to see you anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or, uh, what are you doing in my room? <laughs> or what are you doing at my house? Or what, what are you doing here in jail? Um, didn't you ask me to come? Um, no. <laughs> like that, then you gotta go, okay, great. <clears throat> so chaplaincy is unexpected. You know, it really has good training um, where when our giving is totally expected and our Dharma teachings, our presence is totally planned, expected, we know exactly what's gonna happen. Um, we probably won't be able to stretch our awareness or our compassion to the degree that we need to do it's still pretty much um, it was always under control so even when the buddha was visiting um his mom in uh, the 33rd heaven you know he the buddhists don't worry about um what's going to happen so this is important that you guys listen to this because in the west we think omniscience means like you know exactly what's going to happen Omniscient means you know the nature of reality, so you don't need to know what's going to happen. Right? You already know what's going to happen because it's still the fundamental situation, whether the appearances come or go, right? So we don't know; have to know exactly what needs to happen. Isn't that a relief? <laughs> well, for some people it isn't, but you know, um, I, I usually want to know what's going to happen too, so I like to be prepared, but. Um, uh, the nice part about the journeying to meet someone else is that um, we're prepared to be unprepared, right? That's a mature and professional bodhisattva practice where 
that's called professional. We're prepared to be unprepared. You know, we're prepared to ask for backup or help or assistance or, um, or just go, ooh, I'm not the right chaplain for you. <laughs> What's happened to me? I'm just, the real story is like, who are you? Well, I'm the Buddhist chaplain. I wanted a Muslim chaplain. <laughs> okay, well, there's no Muslim chaplain. You know, this is, this is happened in, you know, 10 years of doing a prison chaplaincy, right? Um, so <clears throat> I've had some really interesting discussions with people that don't want to talk to me. <laughs> God. <clears throat> so in this um, Dharma Center, um, it means uh, we've been willing, I've been willing to, you know, take some, uh, be unprepared for new things. We're very innovative here. Uh, very innovative compared to Asia. Generally, men and women wouldn't be sitting together at all, right? Look at that. Um, it's definite hierarchy. Um, uh, you know, there, there, are no, there are no question and answers, right? You don't raise your hand. <laughs> you know, there's no comment like that. Um, uh, but what's also different about us from that's a result of my chaplaincy approach is that um, you know I'm willing to um, be open and work with people with different lifestyles and beliefs, uh, different personality disorders or mental illness, different issues, right? Um, whereas just a little bit of shout out to groups. Um, a lot of groups are Dharma clubs. We just want really high functioning white people who will donate money. Right? Sit quietly and you know so um I I I do love high functioning people. Um and we do need um a core high functioning people. <laughs> but uh if we're really high functioning bodhisattvas, then we can also work with people that are struggling a bit but still want help, right? If people don't want help, um, I don't, I'm not going to drag them up the mountain, right? That's awkward. And sometimes I don't want help comes after five or 10 years. <laughs> like, I don't want any help anymore. <laughs> In fact, you've ruined my life, you know, but it's <laughs> so that, you know, the I don't want help anymore can come abruptly for those people in helping professions, you know, um, people go AMA. You know, um, against medical advice. So much of my uh, Dharma world isn't just through formal Dharma training with my teachers or in the monastery or retreat centers. It's training in four different hospitals and you know living with a nurse and you know medical issues all the time. So um, every once in a while, people go, you know. Um, you're not helping anymore. Go, okay, got it. Or they just leave. <laughs> what I call AMA. <clears throat> so here, because I really believe in chaplaincy work, that opens us up to, you know, uh, really do a full Mahasiddha Dharma practice. If people have read some of the um, stories of uh, the classic text, the 84 Mahasiddhas, uh, some were pretty strange people, right? Um, some are pretty high functioning folks like, you know, maybe already teachers like Nagarjuna, um, but some were um, very marginal people that still had uh, their own realization and their ability to contribute. Um, but, uh, you know, some of the Mahasiddhas uh, were monastics, some were male, some were female. Um, but just because someone's uh, a good Dharma practitioner doesn't mean they're going to fit into certain boxes, right? So, <laughs> um, uh, you know, not everybody's going to fit into a monastic box, or not everybody has to even call themselves Buddhist or something like that. Not everybody's going to fit into uh, a conventional relationship box. Not everybody's going to fit into a conventional uh, gender box. In Asia, they like boxes. Just in case you ever want to travel, like there's some innovative things, <laughs> but uh, 
generally the, the innovative is taken kind of uh, has to be a little sub rosa or a little bit on the side, right? You can't just interface innovative, you know, you have to kind of, and maybe that's true for America too, actually. It's kind of a conservative country in a lot of ways, right? At least half of it is. So uh, some, some people, uh, you know, like they try certain boxes and then we have to back out of them. And that I consider chaplaincy work too. So I'm very open to people like, I, I want to try, you know, this style of practice and I'll let's see what happens. And I'll say, great, you know, we'll keep the light on for you. Or don't, don't forget to have your, um, you know, string of breadcrumbs if you go into the labyrinth. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, a situation uh, that we're working with here, Alliance for us, Muntuk is interested in coming back to Sacramento um, because the monastic situation has been really challenging. So um, my hope is that and prayers that he will be able to um, be back in Sacramento perhaps as early as the, this coming week, right? So um, for me, the, uh, uh, you know, mostly want someone to be able to travel safely and uh, swiftly. Um, but uh, even even with regular world airlines, nothing is for certain these days, right? Like that. But um, that is my hope. So when he comes back, though, he's not going to be monastic, just going to be Connor. Um, of course, I've been a monastic, um, and uh, I'm in a little different role. They They wouldn't let me quit. So uh, uh, lamas sometimes uh, can continue teaching, even uh, having lay status. I'm just in this kind of special cutout with um, Sarah J. But uh, talking with um, myself and Geshe uh, Damshla Jadarimshe, we think that it's best that um, you know return to householder life. That happens a lot in Asia too. People just don't talk about it. You know, people do um, even Tibetan style, which is meant to be lifetime. A lot of people go, okay, that I learned what I needed to learn, or these were too many challenges or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so I want to return to householder life. So I want to support him in doing that. I don't know if he'll still want to be an attorney like that. <clears throat> I'm, I'm hoping that the Sangha will produce happy attorneys, right? <laughs> That's, I ask people that, like, are you, like, I'm kind of a nosy, so I'll ask people, like, are you a happy attorney? <laughs> They'll say, well, I'm successful. I go, no, that's not the question. <laughs> Actually, I like attorneys a lot, because usually, um, that, you know, they have to learn debate and you have to be, and you do have to be somewhat smart, right? Yeah, so, but I don't know what um, what his needs will be right now, but I want to support him with a soft landing, right? So, um, you know, even when, you know, I came from, you know, monastic life, even though things were kind of fine, even though I was sick and broke, but I was still fine. No one was mad at me, but still it was hard. You know, it's a hard transition. You have to go, you know, think in a different way being a monastic, and then you have to um, think a different way, a little bit different way as householder, right? So those transitions can be difficult, right? Even then, at any time, nothing changed, there wouldn't be a problem, right? No problems if nothing changes. So um, our quality of our practice is mostly uh, and evidenced by how we deal with change, right? <laughs> It'd be easy, like if nothing changes, you'll just look great, <laughs> like that. So I, I think a part of our chaplaincy is also to um, work with, you know, members of our own sangha who just, you know, need support, need help. Doesn't they don't have to be coming back from India or or some long visit to um, heavens at the thirty three, you know. Um, you know, even the Buddha had, um, you know, Ananda, you know, and, and other attendants because he, you know, he had a bad back and bad knees and he's getting up there and every once in a while he was going, ah, 
because it's in the suttas, right? We know it. We went, you know, I, I don't want to, we don't want to give the Dharma talk today. <laughs> and he'd ask, you know, Shariputra or Nanda or somebody else. So a trick question I used to get uh, from my teachers at Naropa um, are, you know, on the test to see if you're paying attention, um, are all the uh, suttas, the Pali suttas spoken by the Buddha? And people haven't done enough scholarship. They say, sure, of course, the Buddha. Spoke. No, not all of them. Not all of them. Some by senior students. So that's why here, you know, I've, I've wanted students to also share their, ex you know, their experience, um, the strength, hope, and experience within their expertise, you know, what they're doing with Dharma practice. And that's part of chaplaincy practice, really, is to say, here, I, I have this level of expertise. I'm sharing it with you, you know. As, as chaplain, I'm not going, I mean, when I'd see people, I'm not pretending I'm being their physician. I don't want to be their therapist. Uh, I don't want to be their mommy or daddy. I'm just, this is chaplain. So um, I'm looking forward to expansion of our chaplaincy role. Um, John Ramche ordained uh, six people, maybe four years ago now. Um, and we have people coming up. And that, however, entails rigorous study and rigorous practice and hanging out because the most important part really is the character structure. Do people have enough bodhicitta? Do people have enough patience to work with annoying people? And that's not all. Do you need patience and forbearance to work with really sad situations, right? It's, it, you know, the hospice movement and, and it is great and um, working with death and dying um, is great. You know, some people are, want to get involved in that. Um, but um, I don't know, it's like, I always want to have the corrective. Same way with therapy programs, you listen to therapy programs, nursing programs. And hostess, and they're all like, enjoy working with people. It's entirely rewarding, and it's the most meaningful thing you ever do. But they don't talk about like, and <laughs> there will be some bad days, you know. <laughs> um, so um, professional bodhisattvas, um, whether um, whatever realm you're in, whether if you're in a professional helping capacity or, or just chaplain capacity. Um, with this parent capacity is we, we need a strong peer structure, you know, we need a strong cohort of people to talk to that are going through similar things that are doing similar kind of jobs, right? Otherwise, people get really isolated and lonely, and um, they don't feel like they have anyone to talk to. That's, that's a difficult situation. Usually, people that are pretty professional, um, uh, that I've run into um, don't they don't act out so much on others in the prison or the hospital or the Dharma center or something because this is kind of a big treatment center. Uh, they usually implode on themselves, right? Because people that get into helping others are usually actually pretty nice people, and and then they they start going through burnout phases of being down on themselves and having perfectionist ideas and not wanting to bug people and ask for help and, you know, just doing other kind of unproductive things. And in other words, your self-care tanks, right? So a big part of being chaplain, being a professional bodhisattva is like we need to have um, people, you know, we can talk to. I, I had this kind of person when I worked at Sutter, um, uh, who was initially my supervisor and then became a friend. Um, and we just used to get together after um, the day, particularly after a horrible day. There's no way to say someone's death or suicide is like, well, it's been a good day. But we were able to get together and we would say something that sounds really like not healthy, but once in a while we'd get together and go, and would say to each other, I don't care. And we'd start laughing, right? Um, we do care, but 
we realized we, we have to be able to release ourselves from guilt and obligation and, um, you know, regret. Because when help, helping people, it doesn't always work out, right? People kill themselves, right? You know, it's like, do everything and they, they'll do it anyway. They could be manifesting, taking their meds, you know, talking all that stuff, signing all the release forms, signing all the suicide contracts, you know, they're gone. And we're just kind of like, what happened? You know, it, it is inevitable that um, we're going to do some self-blame. There's no way to escape that. There's no way you're not going to kind of go, what could I have done differently? You know, there's no way not to have that thought, you know, and that, you know, maybe we won't totally beat up on ourselves, but we're going to feel bad. It's going to be a loss, you know, like, you know, I didn't see something or, you know, like, what, what happened? You know, there just is. There's no way to kind of go, yeah, that happens. <laughs> just like, so um, one of my, um, um, my anti phrases, um, you hear a lot in the therapeutic community, uh, don't, don't work harder than your client and uh, don't take it home. When people say that, I know they're not fit for the profession. Because there are times we have to kind of work harder, or at least more with more expertise, than, or otherwise we have to have a higher energy level or not going to help anybody, right? So when I understand not working harder, we don't, we want, don't want to tip over, right? So that's why I say don't get more than 49%. But if we have to stay uh, charged, then our container has to be bigger. Okay, if someone, you know, it's like you're the, you have a pitcher of water and the cup, the pitcher has to have more water than the cup, right? So the cups, the client or patient, and, and we're helping because you, you don't want to have to run out, right? You don't know exactly, you know, sometimes you start pouring water or, you know, if we said in India milk, you know, and then their cup starts expanding. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, because they start, you know, you add a little fluid to things and some of them go, oh, okay. So uh, as professionals, we, we need to have, you know, we need to have a, a pitcher of water. We're not pouring glass to glass. See you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? You guys know how I am. And then the other thing that's total unbelievable, you know, craziness is when people say, well, I, I don't really worry about people when I go home. What? Come on, of course. So I do worry about people, but my worriness also takes place in a container of compassion and insight, right? And I have to keep that pretty big. Otherwise, it's right here. So it's here. It's still here, right? You know, so um, of course, you're going to worry about people, you know, I mean, you know, think about them. I mean, you can't just block it out. Blocking it out in a really unskillful way means you just carried a big wall that made of bricks that you're carrying around a big sack, right? You get freaking burned out. So professional chaplains, professional bodhisattvas, uh, you know, people, you know, we, we, we still don't give so much that we tip over, but we have to increase our uh, capacity. We have to increase our knowledge and you know, uh, we have to do what some people don't like to talk about because it's self-care, you know, so we do need to do self-care. <laughs> it might not be Kaiser style. Kaiser style is a Hindu little, sorry. Does anybody care Kaiser? No, okay. Well, I am, so I, I, I'm a Kaiser member. So Kaiser, they just say I do a little sheet. <laughs> it's like, here's your self-care sheet, you know. <laughs> No, we need, we need a friend, we need a colleague, we need a cohort. Uh, if we're you know, training to be professional bodhisattvas that we can turn to and say, you know, um, could you, you know, could you take over for me? Or can you just hear me vent? Or could you just hear me say, I don't care and laugh? You know, we need, we need to do that because uh, we need to be able to process things like that. Um, you know, usually they're not, they're not many 
uh, teachers I know that also have, you know, done crisis work and hospital work. And I'm not trying to put myself higher. It's just, it's a different world when you're just talking to nice people in a lecture, right? You know, you can go around and lecture and do retreats and you never really visit anybody at home. You never really talk about their personal struggles, you know? Within the last five years, everyone here has had someone die that they love, right? Everyone. In the next five years, or maybe even the next year, everyone will have someone they know, they love, pass away or get ill, right? That's inevitable, we know, it has to happen. So, you know, as, as bodhisattvas, we, we have to also address that. There's, there's no way that if we misunderstand emptiness, misunderstand the nature mind, we'll start thinking, I'll understand the nature mind and the emptiness, and therefore nothing will bother me anymore and nothing bad will happen. Read the biographies of the great teachers, right? So, uh, stuff stuff still happens <laughs> uh, in fact we lean into you know problems more as bodhisattvas we'll go seek out like oh we're you know it's just we're, we're working with problems from a different point of view right we're working from a different standpoint you know but there's still grief in every bodhisattva's life you know dalai lama cried you know i mean his mom died like why wouldn't he right he loved his mom so there's a lot of misunderstanding in Dharma that the idea is to be emotionally anorexic. <laughs> you know? That's nirvana. No, that's not it. <clears throat> I haven't done as much retreat as some of my colleagues. I've done a lot, but um, you know, not as much as Ken McLeod, whose new book some people are studying like two back to back three years, which is awesome. I like Ken. Um, but I have gotten to know my teachers on levels that most people haven't. And guess what? You, just, you talk to them about what's going on internally and that's the same stuff. They're processing grief, they're processing loss. Um, you know, they're sitting around kind of going, administ administrators, um, at Sarah J are not just going, everything's emptiness, everything's the nature of mind, and we're fine. No, they're kind of going, okay, uh, how can we help Connor here? You know, this person needs to be home. You know, that's just talking. You just have to use rational logic and compassionate mind. You know, you can't just go, everything's empty. In fact, that would be misunderstanding emptiness. So, uh, you know, I'm very uh, grateful for everyone here. Everyone has that, uh, that uh, ends up staying here has that kind of interest. We want to be professional helpers, even if that's not our profession. You, even if we're just, uh, we can be helping others in all different ways. The Mahasiddha, some are musicians, some are, you know, like baked cookies, right? Some made arrows, you know, and to each of the disciplines, they, you know, contributed something that was helpful. So I, I see the La Bab Duchin the, as kind of a, um, you know, a chaplaincy um, call. <laughs> um, of course, the Buddha, there are many stories of the Buddha um, visiting the hell realms too, right? Um, that, uh, that's important as, as part of our practice. I mean, if we just go and visit nice people, I like that too. Um, you know, I like to talk to people at Arden Hills Country Club. That's nice, you know. But uh, we we have to go visit sometimes people that are really struggling in hungry ghost realms or um, people that are highly confused. <clears throat> we have to go visit our parents once in a while, you know. Um, that's <laughs> yeah. So that's part of it. You know, maybe maybe you know, it's like okay. But I was thinking, oh, I haven't talked to my mom in a while, you know. Um, I got, you know, it's like, you work out, you know, it's got to work out, I mean, some issues, you know. So that's always the thing for the holidays, right? Like, family. <laughs> so even the Buddha had a family, right? Even the Buddha had a family, you know, dad, mom, brothers, sisters, cousins, and they didn't all get along. I have a family, Dalai Lama has a family, you guys have families, and um, I know Kensei had families, Jujur Mimshi had families, they have kids, 
and um, I'd get to know the kids of high llamas and guess what they they weren't all um, <laughs> they weren't all cookie cutters you know it's like traditional ministers son and daughter you know like that like they, they a lot of times particularly when not just in America they um, you know so um, you know I, I spent several years studying with um, Choji Rimshay is now down in Denver and um, when he was in Marin and uh, you know he he brought his family all the way from Ladakh uh, his mother had never been outside of Ladakh <laughs> very it's very Tibetan and she got sick when she came to the States the poor thing she had to leave early I mean I get it you know um, so you know I was talking about that with Shoji Rimshe because I'd ask how how are you doing? You know, it didn't look good. It's one mom's sick. And, <clears throat> you know, it's like, how are you doing with that? And he goes, well, you know, I, my parents never really wanted me to you know, do Dharma. We always think, you know, someone's identified as a talker, the parents are thrilled. No, they're not thrilled most of the time, particularly if they're, you know, well off, right? If they have too many kids, they're going great, take it, take him or her. But you know, if, if the family is prosperous by Tibetan standards or something, no, they, they expect you to take over the family business. Right? In this case, it was family travel business. His dad was quite successful. To interpret, ask, ask the, the mom, what was, because she didn't speak any English at all. What's the weirdest thing about America? What do you think she said? Maybe I've shared it before. Dog food. <laughs> that was followed up by the amount of um, you know, brands of bread. Couldn't believe supermarkets. Just didn't, and unbelievable. You know, it, it was unbelievable to see like so many just like you'd have this big building and you know going to certain times even if you go on big ones you know like here like there not might not be many people in the store right it's just freaking weird you know all this food you know instead of a marketplace where you know people are just standing with their little booth and people are looking around it's, it's just crazy crazy ingy you know so <clears throat> all the all the teachers you know have to have their you know own families and they have their own issues you know, and, um, you know, it, and as professional bodhisattvas, you know, we need people we can talk to and say, you know, just going through what I'm going through. And then we also need people to say our successes too. So um, that's what I'm hoping we're doing here at uh, Lions Heart Dharma Center. We can you know, be brave enough to share our, you know, struggles and brave enough to share our successes. So. I like to share that, you know, like this person graduated, this person got their degree, this person won the lottery, you know? <laughs> something like that. We need to share that too. That's called professional, you know, so we celebrate and stand up for each other too, right? You know, somebody uh, did something really neat, you know, I like to hear about it too, right? Got to share successes too. That was one thing that got me through Sutter, not the professional administrative side of Sutter, so Sutter Awards weren't cool, but you know, <laughs> um, but when your colleagues would say, hey, that was really a, you know, incredible job you did with that program or that patient or something, then, then that, it just changes your life, doesn't it? You know, and somebody goes, yeah, I know, oh, that was a really, that was a really hard case. And, you know, you, you, you did it, you know, like that. So um, that, you know, that really, um, that really helped me at times. One time I had, um, uh, you know, we had a patient um, who I was somewhat responsible for, um, an adult who um, had been deeply affected by thalidomide. Do people know what that is? Some people do. Um, this person had no arms and no legs. Um, we had a nice team, you know, she was all suicidal, right? Okay. But, you know, 
that's a tough one, right? You know, because like, um, you know, what do you say? Like, hey, you can be president. You know, it's like, it's, it's real deep suffering, right? She wasn't happy either. It wasn't like, I'm a happy, you know, it's like not all, you know, not all quads or paraplegics are happy, right? You know, so you had just a file reason, like, I'm really not happy being alive. You know, so I, I use that as kind of my chaplaincy call on. You know, it's like, yeah, it's, it's not good, you know, but we're here. And by the way, I don't, you know, this is actual conversation. This, you know, doing my empathy thing. And, but you have to say sometimes to people that have no arms, no legs, by the way, don't drive your wheelchair in the middle of traffic on Howe Avenue. Capiche? You know, it's like, you almost caused a freaking accident, you know? So it's really weird. Of course, that person's suffering. But at the same time, you have to say, as a professional, no, that's not cool. You're engaging others. I mean, let's find another way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know, sometimes it would be uh, really frustrating, not not with her, obviously, but, you know, some people that there's continual, you know, suicidal cutting, right, this way, you know, and at one point, I probably did this because I'm kind of a big mouth, you know what, here's what you do, it's this way, right? You know, you just lose it. You just lose your patience. Like, just do it. You do it this way. And by the way, do both. Do both arms, okay? You know, I didn't feel good after saying, I didn't say both arms, but I probably said, you know, this is the way you do it. Yeah. This is the way you kind of create some hamburger, right? Do it this way. So that was not a good moment as a professional therapist, right? But we, we all, um, fortunately, that person did not. <laughs> <So> <laughs> was able to kind of get back. But that's that's what I'm looking for in professional bodhisattvas, chaplains, like we all, you know, say and make mistakes. Professionals are, do you know how to recover and take ownership and be accountable to it? It's really easy if you never make any mistakes, which is impossible, by the way, you know, like that. So, um, that that's the kind of training we're looking for and the buddha made some mistakes too we know in the suttas that at one point um the sangha was having a rash of suicides do people know that yeah you know they were thinking well look the buddha's always talking about you gotta go to nirvana and why be attached to this body and why take you know and um maybe within I, I didn't have to go back and do the research, but you know, there, you know, maybe you know, five or ten or something. You know, I mean, really incredible number. And he had to kind of back it out, you know, and and maybe start teaching from a different way or say, you know, that's really not what I meant, guys. You know, that's not what we want to do. So I'm not saying it was a mistake, but you know, still, you know, our words as helpers can be taken the wrong way, and. As professional helpers, we have to own that. We can say, well, you misunderstood me, you know, but still they're in trouble, right? So we have to say, um, well, uh, I need to say it another way, right? I have to say it another way. <clears throat> One of the uh, social workers I liked, et cetera, um, was old, meaning now he's, he's my age. <laughs> this was 30 years ago. And we'd go around and treatment team and people would say, this person's doing this and they're not doing this, they're not doing this, they're not doing this, they're not doing this, right? I'm sure some of you have been in that kind of consultation or treatment team. You know, their BP's this and their BP's this, but they're not doing this, they're not doing this. Finally got to Jerry, <laughs> Jerry said, yes, but what are we doing for the patient? Blows me away. The hard part of that, crickets, dead silence. What, what are we here for, right? So if nothing's working, what do you do? Try something else. 
yeah, right, exactly right. You know, no, it's called, <laughs> that's one thing my supervisor, Terry, and I used to laugh about, like, mental health is the only thing where if it doesn't work, you blame the patient. <laughs> right? <laughs> They're resistant, you know, <laughs> you know didn't, they didn't do the work. You know, well, yeah, of course, they're freaking mentally depressed. And, you know, yeah, that's why they're in the hospital. Because if they could do the work from their side. So uh, obviously I have strong feelings still about, you know, like we have to work smarter. We don't have to work to burn out. But like if you're throwing someone a life preserver, that means you're rescuing and that's the right thing to do. Doesn't mean you're going to jump in the ocean with them, right? I learned that as a water safety instructor in camp. Like, ever been pushed down in the water trying to help someone swim? Ever had your head pushed under? Yeah, it's a powerful experience. So, so now it's it's noon. So uh, I really like this holiday, and hope what I've said has been um, not too weird and a little bit helpful. Um, there's some time for a comment and. Um, then we have people on, on what I like to call the rainbow bridge <laughs> through technology. <laughs> if anybody wants to add anything, um, you know, maybe we can entertain a few comments, questions, and complaints. Charlotte has her hand up on the, does that mean, what does that mean? And maybe people forget to unmute themselves, you know, that's always a thing. And then somebody else has their hand up, I can tell. Is it, doesn't that mean they're asking a question? So uh, does someone fill us, can you unmute yourself? And then we could hear from you. Okay. I didn't have a question, Mama La. Oh, you didn't? Okay. I cool. enjoyed your, your talk and I thought it was very thought provoking, but I didn't have okay. a question. Oh, okay, good. Well, thanks for the endorsement, Charlotte. Okay. All right, well, maybe, does it, but on a screen, doesn't a hand mean someone's got a question? You don't see it? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So I, I don't, you know, like being in traffic jams in India cured me of uh, impatience with cars, but I'm still working with technology impatience. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hi. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Loma. Uh, I, I don't know if I understand the difference between caring for someone and uh, attachment, the idea of not, not attachment, and at the same time caring so much for someone. I, I don't know the line where. Very simply, and it sounds maybe too simple, is when we're talking about attachment or is we're wanting an impossible thing from that situation or person. An impossible thing. Like, I want someone to live forever. I want to win the lottery without buying a ticket. I want everyone to get along right now. You know, just wanting, I want changing things to be permanent. I want permanent things to change. That, that's attachment, where we're, we're really um, want something impossible out of the situation. And usually it's some version of, I want something that's impermanent to be permanent, to stay the same, or I want something that's permanent to change, right? So we confuse those two. So it's, the attachment is like, we just, we just won't let go of our, you know, wrong view, really. And it's enormously important um, to let go, but I know it's um, really difficult because it isn't just a cognitive thing. We have a lot of emotional you know, hopes and fears. We have a lot of uh, investment. But that's attachment, you know. 
where um, we can be deeply caring and, and strong bodhicitta, strong love, strong kindness, strong empathy, but it's based in, we, we understand the nature of a reality and the nature of people. So we're still grieving. Doesn't mean if you understand impermanence, like I said earlier, it doesn't mean that you're not gonna cry because that crying is, is a way of, of letting go too, right? Yeah. You understand, you do, you understand. Thanks for coming back, Robert. We've missed you. We've missed you, yeah. Thanks for being here. We've missed you. So you made a journey like the Buddha's, right? So I was I was thinking, oh, how's Roberto? So fortunately, you, you told a few people like, oh, I'll, I'll just be gone for a while, but I'll be back, right? So that was really smart, right? So I was thinking, where's Roberto? Yeah, so you're back, it's fantastic. Yeah, and I know you, you're still on a journey, I know that. But you're, we're, we're taking the journey alongside you, okay? Can't take your, your journey, is yours, but we're alongside you. That's what Sangha is, we're doing it with you. Stay for lunch. So maybe we can end with like prayers. That'd be good. Dedication. Thank you. Due to the merits yeah, of these virtuous actions, actions may, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha, Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. state. May, may the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. May, may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chenrezin Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the, the teachings, teachings of the Buddha, Buddha flourish, flourish, and may, may the upholders of the teachings, teachings remain forever. May, may all migrators achieve happiness, and, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instruction to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Lusangdragpa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you, um, and uh, sorry, I was just absorbed. <laughs> um, just, uh, we don't pass a basket around, but um, any donation in any amount would be greatly appreciated. Again, to keep the lights on, keep this program going, to keep these beautiful, powerful talks going so that we can continue to benefit from everything that is happening here. Thank you.